Hello, everyone, and welcome into CrushTheStreet.com. I'm Kenneth Amaduri, and I'm joined today with Luis Camarasano of SmallGold.com. We will put the link in the description area. Someone who's been on the show a, a number of times and has articulated what has been going on in the economy, in the markets, in gold and silver, and talked about uh, cryptocurrency as well. And we're going to be discussing all of those things today. Uh, we got an interesting situation unfolding uh, in the Middle East, uh, the withdrawing of the U.S. presence there and just the debacle, the, the overrunning of Kabul by the Taliban and just the news just going crazy over this. And it's just interesting to me and another example of how uh, anti common sense our leaders of the world can be, whether we're talking about the markets, uh, money printing, inflation, you know, the welfare state, uh, health on the pandemic side, and even uh, foreign relations. It just seems all interconnected and we get clouded by our biases. And, uh, you know, I think that's just going to lead into everything else we're talking about today. But unfortunately, it's just an absolute mess in the Middle East. And, you know, with trillions of dollars spent, uh, essentially nothing to show for it and uh, unraveling quickly here. So, uh, Lewis, uh, let's get your thoughts on the markets and uh, what we're seeing here. But, um, you know, maybe you can comment on what we're seeing in the Middle East in a general sense. I mean, I don't expect you to be an expert on it, but just, you know, based on what you've seen throughout the years and, you know, does this surprise you in any way? No, because it surprises me that if you're thinking rationally, they've had a, a date for withdrawal from Afghanistan for months now. I think there was a set date where the U.S. was supposed to leave. And if you're going to leave, there is the issue that you've, you've tipped off the enemy that that's when you're going to leave. But you generally have some type of orderly plan. And I believe there's a famous video now of, of them asking Joe Biden, is this going to be like leaving Saigon with the, the helicopters over um, the U.S. embassy? And he says, no, uh, absolutely not. We're prepared for this. And then just two days ago, you see the helicopters over the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, the whole chaos unfolding as the withdrawal. Now, again, I'm not an expert on how to withdraw from these situations, you know, 20 years in Afghanistan, 15 years in Vietnam. But you would think, though, that logically, if there's a plan, that the plan should go better than it, it actually did. And then you just have to question whether it's ineptitude of the people involved or whether they have other unseen agendas that we're not aware of, that someone's profiting from this type of chaos. I don't know. But, but with regard to the markets, this is the kind of situation where you have geopolitical turmoil, where you would think that gold and silver would do well. And the markets are not responding. The gold and silver are down. Um, the dollar you would expect to go down on this, the dollar is actually up in the last couple of days. So it is kind of hard to look at things um, on the surface, it, it almost seems to me like we're missing some piece of information and we're analyzing things on the basis of what we, the facts we have, and we're not getting, we're not seeing what you would think would be the logical result of this turmoil, which would be rising gold and silver prices, declining dollars. Yeah. Well, so true. And, uh, and, and it just, for me, it just it's the ongoing apologizing for the rest of the world, apologizing for extreme terrorism. I mean, when you have these uh, people in office right now, it's the Democrats. Uh, they're just so hesitant and so weak uh, when it comes to putting America first and and uh, and and just being strong as a country. And, and this is the type of stuff we get. We get the border overran. Uh, you know, Israel, we just had a rise up in, in terrorism. Uh, and it's and it's just there's a lack of leadership. And the rest of the world sees that. And, and we know that's happening. And I don't know. It's so hard to know if it's some sort of profiting thing. I just for me, on at the very least, there's this bias to apologize to the rest of the world and to 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 side with the the bad guy in a way or, or the other team you know i'm not going to say people who want to come to this country uh and and have a better life are bad people but i i'm not going to apologize for like the worst people in the world who are you know raping women and children and and killing people and and treating uh, gays horribly and and all these things that 
the the you know progressive left says they're uh, a four. I mean, and then they apologize for like the worst people in the world that offend those very things. I mean, it's just it's so backwards. Uh, and and they and I think they get clouded and and in the face of that they're weak and there's a rise up against them uh, and so I think that's what we're dealing with and unfortunately it leads into the markets like you were saying the manipulation of the markets the trillions of dollars that are being spent the the three point five trillion dollar budget plan that's going to go to a ton of waste and inflation and my goodness did you see that. Uh, there was that news headline for how many people signed the petition to get more stimulus checks. There was like already 3 million signatures for like ongoing stimulus in the US. I mean, again, it's just short term gratification at the expense of uh, future prosperity. And that's what we're seeing. Yeah, there was that guy, I can't think of the name of the guy who said that um, the Republic ends when people realize they can vote themselves a raise. And, and that's what you're seeing, because once you realize, oh, if we just tell the leaders, so to speak, we want more money and they can give us more money, not understanding the consequences that they're really not giving you anything that isn't yours already or that they're going to have to borrow to give you. That's when you see an unwinding of the economy and an unwinding of society, because if you expect to get something for nothing and then to continue to get something for nothing, it goes against economics because money represents some type of value of something that's been produced, not something someone can just give you that they can print out of thin air. Yeah. And the whole argument that the United States should have this largesse and let open borders and, and give away money, foreign aid, and, and just basically pay for every, every ill and, and provide health care is on the basis that the United States is a wealthy country. Well, how did it get to be a wealthy country? It got to be a wealthy country by its inhabitants and its citizens working in a society where they produce stuff so there's an excess of money. But now they're actually just creating that excess of money by printing it. At some point, the United States won't be a wealthy country if it lives far beyond its means, and which is what it's doing. Yeah. And then if the people that are getting the money decide, well, now I'm gonna go out and spend that money, but I'm not working, well, they're not adding to the value of the overall goods and services produced, but now they're a consumer of those services Who's going to work to produce the services that they want to buy with the free money that they got? Well, right. if they're not working. That means the companies are going to have to raise, raise wages for the people who are still working, which means they're going to have to raise prices. And they may even have shortages because not enough people are working to produce the goods and services because the demand hasn't dried up. But this is the whole Keynesian concept is that if you hand people money, well, now you have demand. But how do you increase supply if people aren't working? And, and you've told them, you don't have to work. We're going to print more money. By the way, sign this petition. And if we get enough signatures, we're going to give you more money. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so backwards. I mean, it's kind of like a, you know, you trying to get a, a credit limit raise on your American Express card. And you got that by working more and, and uh, having higher income. So then American Express goes and gives you a higher credit limit. So then you keep spending more and more and then now you got all these bills that you're paying and it's almost like a self-fulfilling uh back to square one and now we're now we're living off this high credit limit that we were given because of the work we put in on the front end but then now it's just imploding on itself because well i'll add to your analogy now you decide you know what i have a credit limit i'm not going to work anymore yeah yeah exactly well, and then now we're seeing the consequences of inflation. I mean, if you want to go rent a car, you're paying, you know, up. And I remember the days, you know, not that long ago, you get a car for what, six, seven bucks a day if you're driving it around town or, you know, like these $10 yep. a yep. day. The insurance rentals. costs more than the, the rental car almost, the insurance and the gas. Yeah. <laughs> it's just insane, though. I mean, we're, we're, uh, nowadays, it's like, it was like $200 a day to get a yep. van for a couple of days. And I had booked that in advance and someone had to do it kind of at the counter counter. And they were, they paid $300 uh, to take their family around for a few days a day uh, for an SUV. And I was just like blown away by how much uh, things are going up and how inefficient things are, because that's the problem. I mean, right now the airlines are all screwed up. You can hardly go, go it anywhere on time. 
And then that throws off the Uber drivers who now want to charge more. And then, you know, it's just, everything's inefficient and, and it's the inefficiencies that are now costing us more, cost the economy more. And I don't know if there's an end to that. Well, when you have 10.2 billion job openings, that adds to the inefficiency. That means there are 10 million jobs that would be filled and would alleviate a lot of those inefficiencies because they would be producing the goods and services on time for people to consume. But right now we have that mis imbalance of people working and not working and people, the economy not working at the proper capacity, but yet it's expected to perform meaning produce the goods and services so that people who have the free money can buy them. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Well, I definitely think that there's some incentive for this to go on because there's a lack of awareness happening by the government to allow a, a real fix to take place. And, and that's unfortunate. Um, and so I, I'm not sure we're going to see that happen. Uh, but what's odd, and this happened, you know, a week and a half ago or so, we saw the Friday uh, gold go down 50 bucks. And then Sunday night, uh, gold crashes again. I mean, goes under $1,700 in the, you know, Sunday night late. And, um, you know, open, and we go into the Monday and, and uh, it closes that gap a little bit. You know, it didn't, uh, it didn't trade uh, at that low for very long, which is just highly odd. but. Again, the, the threat of rumors of uh, the rumors of potential tightening, you know, things are getting better. Things are on the right track was enough to just create this massive amount of gravity to enter gold. And, and that's just what's so odd to me. Uh, gold has so much gravity against it. But then, you know, all this news of inflation, trillions of dollars being printed, uh, that should have been, you know, wind in the sails wind in the uh, sales of gold, but we, we haven't seen that, unfortunately. But then the threat of uh, tightening, just the, it's free fall moment. Yeah, you have, a, you're right on, the, it, it only goes one way because we've had years of unlimited stimulus, years of zero negative interest rates across the globe. And that didn't seem to help. And now it's like, well, they might raise, they might tighten in 2023 or late 2022, and they might raise interest rates a quarter of a point. Oh, well, that's enough to drop gold a couple hundred dollars. That's crazy. And that's because the, the markets are not really, we, we've talked about this with respect to gold, silver, all markets, I believe in the last 30 years have become increasingly the domain of interventions by governments and large players. And they basically just almost set prices where they want them to be. They either do it directly or indirectly through uh, futures contracts, through Federal Reserve intervention, through stimulus, whatever it is, you now have companies that make no money, have no profit, and that doesn't seem to bother Wall Street at all. I mean, Tesla's a great example of that. The company's never made a dime, and somehow it's valued in the hundreds of billions of dollars just because. Because one day, what? I, I don't understand. It used to be you couldn't go public and you couldn't get on an exchange unless you'd shown two or three years of profitability. And now you have companies who basically exist in the public markets for over a decade, never making any money and continue to have their stock price rise. And now we have companies that go higher on the basis that they're so bad that there's people willing to buy them because their short sellers are thinking rationally that maybe GameStop has seen its better days. Maybe uh, people going to the theater and AMC has seen its better days. You now have people flooding into those shares kind of in a, a reverse psychology. And they're saying, no, no, those are worth more because we say they are. You guys can say that uh, Tesla is worth a lot and these other companies are worth a lot and whatever cryptocurrency you want to say is worth a lot. We're going to say AMC, GameStop, Blockbuster, whatever it is, we're just going to buy those stocks and it becomes... Uh, the reverse uh, situation where a company that shouldn't be worth anything becomes worth something because now individual investors are just pouring their free money into stocks that really have no profits and have been declining in, in revenues for years. So it is a crazy situation where it used to be you wanted to create a product or service and through the dint of your entrepreneurial expertise and hiring people and growing your business and growing your profit that you'd be rewarded a valuation. 
uh, from the public markets. That's no longer the case. The stocks that do the best now are the ones that have some story, that have some supposed charismatic leader at the helm, or companies that are so bad that Wall Street bets are willing to throw money at them to, to make them go higher. It's the same you even see with Dogecoin. Everyone knows that Dogecoin, on the basis of regular fundamentals of cryptocurrencies, is a joke. It's got 340 billion coins out there compared to some of the other cryptocurrencies. There's nothing special about it. No one really even uses it. It goes higher because it's bought on Robinhood and because Elon Musk and now Mark Cuban tout it. And that's it. You know, people yeah. just, the sense of valuation is, is all out the window. And are you rational to follow the new valuation model and make money on things that shouldn't make money? Or are you stubborn and you say, well, gold should be higher and silver should be higher. I'm going to buy that instead because one day, you know, that's going to, people are going to come to their senses. I don't know. I think we're very far based on your introduction of people being anywhere near coming to their senses. Well, and people keep getting confused. And that's what I think one of the things that have uh, kept gold back and, and they're so conditioned. And I think that's part of it too, is conditioning the people to not trust gold and silver as right. an inflation hedge. They keep, for whatever reason, they're able to really control everyone and control the narrative. And, um, you know, cryptocurrency has distracted many people. Crypto has acted the way gold and silver should have acted in the face of uh, extreme money printing. I mean, what, what everyone wanted to see in gold and silver happened by buying Bitcoin and Ethereum in the early yep. days. I mean, even if you bought, I mean, there's, there's almost no time in history where if you would have bought, you'd be down on your, your crypto, except Correct. for very short windows. And just so, so if you go um, back to just May, that's about it. Anything before then, if you bought Bitcoin before that, you're up. You're at $47,000, $46,000 today. Absolutely. Now, you might have to deal with roller coasters, but uh, yeah. the chart, it, everybody's up on. Uh, and, you know, I know a lot of people, they didn't hold on when they should have, and they sold at the wrong times yeah. and bought at the wrong times, quote unquote. Um, and so... That's, that's the nuances of that. So, I, I mean, it's another discussion of investor psychology. But uh, definitely something that has confused people and made it difficult to own gold. Now, let's talk silver. I mean, you know, we talk about the gold-silver ratio, you know, the same story, same story, 10 to 1, 9 to 1 coming out of the ground. Uh, you know, some are saying it's coming out 8, eight to 1. You know, the problem is that silver is 75, 75 to 1 you know, at the moment, and it continues to be there. And you, you got to start asking your question, is this the new normal for silver to gold? And it's gold in its new normal. I mean, that's, these are the real questions people are asking. Now I do have, I, I've studied the gold silver ratio and I do have an explanation for that. I used to insist like you did and others that the gold silver ratio should be lower on the basis of historic evidence and basis of the, um, the amount coming out of the ground, the amount that's available in the ground, and the amount that's available above ground. I've managed to rationalize why the gold-silver ratio is higher. Here's what it is. First of all, the price of gold was set in 1934 by Congress at $35 an ounce. So from 1934 to 1975, also Americans weren't allowed to buy gold. So the price of gold stayed at $35. So the period of time during there is irrelevant for the price of gold because silver wasn't controlled the same way gold was. So the gold-silver ratio at that point is irrelevant because gold never traded in a free market. Ever since 1975, when they allowed Americans to buy gold, the gold-silver ratio has drifted higher. And that's because it had to make up for those period of times where gold was fixed at $35. That, that's one reason. Another reason why the gold-silver ratio, I think, won't go back to the lower levels is because silver has been completely demonetized since 1965 or 1968 when they eliminated the silver certificates. Gold still maintains a monetary premium in that central banks hold gold, increase their gold uh, holdings, and it is viewed as a tier one asset. So silver has lost that premium of being money. Now you could say, well, silver is money because it's always been money. Well, yes, but not in the eyes of the larger institutional investors and in the eyes of the, the people who control money, i.e. the central banks. 
So those are the two main reasons why gold, the gold-silver ratio has risen ever since 1975 and has maintained a much higher ratio is because it, one, it had to make up for 35 years of, of fixed price suppression at $35 an ounce. And two, silver has been completely crushed as and, and completely removed from the monetary system. There's no more silver coins, so there's no demand for governments to make silver coins. I'll give you a quick number. In 1964, the US Mint printed or made silver coins amounting to about 750 million ounces of silver. And to date, they haven't even made that many American silver eagles for sale. And this is what they were making just for people to use. And at the time you had Canada, the United States, England, Australia, China, India, all countries were minting silver coins. They don't do that anymore. So silver has been removed from the monetary system so that that monetary premium is gone, whereas gold retains its monetary premium. So I think that explains the gold-silver ratio. What it doesn't explain is why the silver price still is mired. Yeah, it's still not even anywhere near its 1980 high or even its 2011 high. And part of that also is because I think that part of it has to do with crypto, but this started well before crypto became a real driver of moving funds away from gold and silver. But I think in the last three years, it really has moved uh, money away from gold and silver, because if you just look at the amount of investment in the crypto space, not just Wall Street investment, Silicon Valley investment, but just all the people that are involved intellectually in producing and engineering and programming, it's far more than people that are engaged in the, um, the gold and silver. And one of the things, an offshoot of this, Ken, is that um, the price of silver, where it has risen, and this, is, this to me is inflation, is in the price of the physical silver that you buy. And that's, it's, physical silver is subject to the same dictates of labor, uh, supply chains as we, you know, because of COVID and because of um, just the general market, that it becomes an area where there's less investment in, in not just mining, but in refining and minting. I mean, how many mints are springing up along the, across the country, across the world to meet this demand? Well, they're not because there isn't that tremendous amount of demand for minted coins. And the reason, and it becomes a, a, a vicious counter circle because people are not buying silver, silver in the same amounts that would require the investment. And even if they did, they can't get the people to work, they can't get the supply chains, they can't get the refinement. So it, it's in decline. So you end up paying four, five, seven dollars over spot for a silver coin. And that in itself is a disincentive to buy physical silver when you've got all these other options. You can go in the stock market and buy some ridiculous stock and it'll go up. You can buy basically anything and it'll go up. But the worst thing about buying physical silver, unfortunately, is even if it does go up, if you go to sell it, you really have to get a massive increase in the price of silver to make back that premium you paid on the front end, because on the back end, the dealer is not going to pay you more than a dollar or two on the spot. So I yeah. think that that's one another reason why silver has kind of really been held down. And the third reason, I think, again, is the now we're at the point where the cryptocurrencies not only are attracting the investment, but if you just talk to the average person, like when the people will say horses are transportation, they've been transportation for a thousand years, car comes along, it's faster, it's cheaper, it's more dangerous. So what? People take the faster option. Well, right now, in terms of one of the reasons silver and gold were money was one of the main reasons was they were portable and divisible. That was the best thing about gold and silver. You can get them a little pieces, you can trade them, it was beautiful. Well, now no one trades and people don't want even regular coins in their pocket they trade digitally. So people pick the fast, even if it's not, even if it's less secure or whatever, they don't have it. People are used to transmitting credit card, wire transfer, phone. They don't want to carry cash around. So the, the, one of the main features of silver that it's portable is gone away because something faster has come along. And then the other thing is in industry, that was another thing that I thought, well, okay, forget the monetary side. Silver is awesome because We've got all these new applications. We've got solar online. We've got electronics coming in. We've got a medical, it's, it's antibacterial. Anti, yeah, it's, it's a great metal. It's got more uses than any other metal on the planet. But they've figured out how to use less silver in electronics, less silver in solar panels. So that demand, while they're making more electronics and more solar panels, actually only solar panel usage is increased in the amount of silver required, but electronics are actually using overall less so you don't have that demand and then you've got the supply coming in 
from the paper silver. And that's really crushed gold and silver because gold and silver traders are no like, on, like anyone else. They just want the fiat profit. They don't care when they trade futures. They're going to knock it down or they're going to raise it. They don't take the physical delivery because what are they going to do with it? All they want is the, the profit. So this demand side, I mean, supply side gets, even if you kind of could overwhelm the, the short sellers on the physical side, they can just throw more supply at it just by paper contracts. And as I mentioned, we're not really seeing tenfold, fivefold, even threefold increases in physical silver buying. And physical retail silver buying is only 15, 20% of overall demand anyway. So that's how I explain silver versus gold. I think there's still a, a larger gold demand. Also, institutions aren't going to buy and hold silver just because of the storage cost. You know, even a million dollars worth of silver is going to be very hard to, to move. And you're talking about people who are going to invest 20, 30, 50 million dollars. You're talking about monster box upon monster box and pallets. And that's where silver becomes uh, less attractive to gold as well. Yeah. So that's, I've been a, I'm a huge silver fan, but th those are, I had to look at reasons why silver hasn't, hasn't pulled out. And it's not just manipulation. There's, there's other factors, but manipulation still factors into it with the naked short sell. Yeah. But that's adding insult to injury, I believe. Absolutely. Well, you know, and it's one of those things too, where um, you brought up the fees, the transaction fees of gold and silver. You know, if it wasn't for the fact that it hasn't moved that much, the transaction fees wouldn't be that nominal. I mean, the, right. the, but unfortunately, you know, you got to think about, okay, well, I've paid $30 for my silver and it's a 23 and they're only going to give me, you know, at most 24 or 25. Right. And it's like, that sucks. But, you know, crypto, you know, you can buy Bitcoin. I remember this was a couple of weeks ago. Bitcoin was, you know, 32.7, you know, but then after you pay the fees, you're probably going to pay 33.2 at, at the 32.7 spot price. But it doesn't even matter because you're going to go, it's going to move 5% up or down in one day anyways. And look, we're at 47,000. You don't even think about the transaction fees or something that's moving. But unfortunately, we've been demoralized. And and it's like we got to look at every penny when it comes to gold and silver because that's that we're paying that. That's what uh, that's what we're paying, and we try to delude ourselves like, oh well, it doesn't matter, you know. Uh, It'll be fifty dollars. However many it? ounces you have, and all these different things. But you know, the the fact is, the cheaper it is, the more ounces you can stack, and and the more expensive it is uh, on a fiat currency basis, the less you have. So. Uh, there's a real consequence to that. And that's why, you know, I, I don't know, after 10 years, people say you're thinking short term, you're cherry picking your data. I'm like, not really, because everyone says, well, one day, one day. And it's like, how long are you going to live? I mean, you know, 15 years. I mean, actually, since 1980, other than the spurt in price from 79 to 1980, when the Hunts brothers were involved and the price went to 50, you basically then were in the wilderness from 1980 to 2009, 10, and 11. And then ever since 2011, it's been another 10 years of, of horrendous returns on silver. And there's reasons for it. And gold hasn't been much better, you know. And we can, we can rationalize and we can complain. And I, I don't know. I, I just have to take a more realistic approach and say the world doesn't think the way I do. The world doesn't, isn't rational. The world doesn't view the history of money the way I do. The world doesn't view the solid characteristics of gold and silver the way I do. I mean, how can you explain the massive rise in AMC or GameStop? There's, it, it's almost like you'd have to make it up. And yet those are real world gains that people are making on buying meme stocks. And in a sense, memes are more valuable than gold. It's crazy, yeah. but... It, Let that sink it, in. I mean, uh, it, one of the things that I've had to tell people and I've said on this uh, mm -hmm. show before, and that is you have to be prepared to be wrong. I mean, there's been right. no time when Amazon has been cheap, but uh, it continued to go up. You know, it, and, and the fact is what people weren't factoring in was just the massive growth, the marketing, the takeover, and the crushing of the rest of the world in terms of, right small town shops, but it, they never, it was so hard for them to make a profit, but that didn't matter to the stock price. And people didn't factor that in. They tried to use old fundamental analysis that just didn't yep. add up and, and wasn't practical 
for the fact that Amazon was just going to continue to go higher and be an amazing stock to own. And th th there's your answer. I mean, the world values things differently, partially because people are educated differently, partially because governments act differently today, partially because we've been off the gold standard since 1971, partially because of ridiculous changes in monetary policy, partially because uh, the Federal Reserve's um, mandate has changed from just uh, stable dollar to uh, full full employment. And now they're talking that they're, they're responsible for uh, a whole line of social justice issues, uh, equality, equity. They're, they're going to solve a uh, global warming is another issue the Fed is now involved in. These are things that banks were not involved in before. And these are things that people place valuations on. Mm. Carbon credits. These are things that are outside of the traditional valuation models. Memes having a value. That's like saying comic books when we were kids had value beyond the price of the comic book. <laughs> Today, the, the Dogecoin is a classic example, but there's many examples. Things just become memes and they become values. Look at, what are those things called? NFTs, non-fungible tokens, where, yeah. where you, someone buys something just because it's, it's a unique digital asset. Buys when, a screenshot. But the screenshot, you can get the exact same screenshot. The only thing you don't have is the token that says it was the original screenshot, even though you actually own exactly the same thing. And it's really, you, you could see it a thousand times. So people are definitely valuing things in a way that I don't value them, but I don't create the market. I don't create valuation. And that's the problem I have when I talk to my fellow uh, gold and silver aficionados is they, they just look at me like, you've gone over to the other side. I say, no, no, I, I haven't. But I recognize that the world doesn't think the way we do, or at least the markets don't. And I don't anticipate, I don't see it getting better. I actually see it going further in the other direction. Yeah. I mean, do you see, can it going, do you see people coming? A lot of people say, oh, once they realize this, they're going to rush into the metals. I'm like, no, they'll rush into chocolate bars before they rush into the metals. They don't even know. <laughs> No, you know, you remember there, there was, was good Twitter? news that Palantir uh, bought uh, a ton of gold bars I or saw something that. like I that. Saw that. Yeah, and, and you know what? That to me was, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna do an article on this, uh, but that to me was a sign of the gap being bridged between the millennials who seemingly were never gonna buy gold to uh -huh. to uh, hey, eventually fundamentals matter. And I think that the meme stock, the, the high growth stuff that people were buying in 2020 into 2021, Palantir was a big representative of that. I think that's good news for uh, gold going forward and, and just the inevitable. I mean, I don't think, I think ultimately the truth is the truth and gold will ultimately have the value. You know, maybe I'll be dead by the time it actually has its right. move. Hopefully not. But uh, this is a sign that uh, even people will eventually buy gold. And I think that it, it was a sign in the, the right direction for, for my belief. Yeah, you're right. And if you look at the Soviet Union, that should never have lasted as long as it did. Though. You know, and there's the Keynes quote about how markets can remain uh, irrational longer than they can remain solvent. And I always say they can remain manipulated longer than, than you, they can, you can remain solvent. I mean, Yes, if you sit it through and you say, you know, you're going to sit on gold for the next hundred years, you may be proven to be correct, but you won't be around. You ever see that Twilight Zone show where they, where they come back from? I can't think of the name of it. They, they come, it takes place, it's made in 1961, it takes place in 2061, and they commit this caper and they steal gold, but then they have to put themselves asleep for hundred years. They're going to come back and get the gold. When they come back, it's not worth anything. Yeah, yeah, they're making they're 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 making gold, right? I think that's I don't know. What yeah, it they're was. they're what they uh, I, something along the lines of of yeah, they've learned to mine it or they learned to yes, yes, that's before they it, learned right? how to make it exactly. Yeah, no, that was a good one. I know, I know. Well, and that's the thing; it goes back to we don't know what we don't know, and there's right. factors that are true in uh, 1960 that may not be true in 2030. I mean, right. realist, think about think about some of the things that might change over the next 10 years. I mean, we look at things that are just may, maybe miserably hopeless, maybe the worst intersection in your town. You're like, oh, my God, they're building more and more homes. 
And, you know, I, I don't know what the hell they're ever going to do about this. And, and then, you know, now, you know, you, they're talking about uh, taxis, like sky, sky taxis that, you know, pick people up and fly people places, you know, like drones. And it's like, okay, if that all of a sudden becomes a real viable thing, I mean, the, your real estate, your location and, and in relation to traffic, this could be a thing of the past in 50 years or 100 years. Right. right. Yeah. Well, even with COVID, uh, the restrictions that they placed on people working, it started. And, and plus, it's no longer advantageous to live in a city because that's the place where you have the least freedom of movement. It makes more sense to commute from a place where you actually enjoy the surroundings. And so that's a big change in real estate. And real estate's different. You know, one thing I was thinking about real estate is your gold and silver investments do not depend on their value based on who your neighbors are. That's your real estate does. But even so, you would think that would make, that would be a plus for gold and silver, but it, it just it hasn't seemed to move it. The other thing that's different is one of the other differences is if you look at gold through history, as the price of gold rises, the production of gold does increase because they figure out ways that were too expensive before to mine it, they figure out how to get that gold. And that's really why, and I'm, I'm intuitively and philosophically against Bitcoin, but the concept of digital scarcity, it, once people agree that they want a digital asset, it becomes compelling because gold, they can always make or find more as the price goes higher. And then also half the demand goes away when the price goes higher because people aren't gonna buy the gold jewelry. With Bitcoin, they've already mined 19 million of the 21. And if people actually want that stuff, there isn't any more. They can't mine more. They can't make more. All they can do is raise the price. Yeah. Well, and and just to add to that, the Lewis, uh, the f I would agree with you. The Intuitively, intellectually, the fact that Bitcoin is something that could just be created, not Bitcoin itself, but another right. Bitcoin. But what we haven't fully appreciated and what took me some time to appreciate was the that network effect that people are right. using bitcoin they're not using something else that's just going to be created today uh and that's the nuance that's the factor that has that gives bitcoin the value it's that transactional network that people have committed to and you know it's maybe it's more speculative because it it can be replicated to in theory you know, unlike gold, but, you right. know, if people continue to use it and the network continues to grow and it continues to show itself resilient, it's just going to keep getting more and more valuable because more and more people will demand it. Yeah. And the only thing that can challenge that, I don't think is Dogecoin. I mean, Dogecoin, I'm, I'm stunned because it's yeah. not limited in, in value, but a coin like Litecoin, which is, is the easier example of where well, you can just make another Bitcoin. Bitcoin's 21 million use, uh, cap and Litecoin is 84 million. So logic would tell you if Litecoin just develops at the same pace, it'll always be a quarter the size of Bitcoin. Well, it's not. I mean, it has some value. It's got it's worth 10, 12 billion uh, dollars, but- uh, But it doesn't have a worth... network of people. It, well, it has a, well, the difference is it has a network and it has a bigger network than Doge. And yet Doge is three times the size of Litecoin. But the point is, is, is that Bitcoin has established the concept that it is 21 million and that is a cap and that is what people are looking at. They're not saying, oh, anyone can do it and you can make all these different coins because if that were the case, it'd be a Litecoin and there'd be 10 other coins right behind it. And really Litecoin is the only cryptocurrency that's anywhere near, and I say cryptocurrency, one that's not a token, but one that's actual currency that's anywhere near Bitcoin and it's not anywhere near Bitcoin. And then after that, it just falls off the, the, the cliff. You got Dash, you got Monero, you got uh, right, Dash, right. Bcash. Well, and I, and I think that's the difference though, right? If you really think about it, you know, people, Litecoin has everything Bitcoin has, right? Yep. So therefore it could be another Bitcoin, but if it doesn't have the people uh, as Bitcoin does have, then it's just another one. And you can have a million other Litecoins. But Bitcoin is the one that people have, have decided to use to a large degree. And uh, that's, a, that's a hard thing to value is, is people's adoption. Uh, how, may, how much adoption is something like this going to get? And I think that's what's difficult for people to wrap their minds around, to quantify, to forecast. And uh, I understand that. I get it. But, you know, it's been good to be on the right side of that trade. I'll be honest.
but <laughs> um, anyways, uh, Lewis, my goodness, what a, what a great call. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity to share some, uh, to share some uh, closing thoughts here. Anything that you have that might be going on in your website, uh, follow you at Twitter, the people who want to follow you at Twitter. Um, yeah, share some closing thoughts. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I've been, um, I've, I've haven't used YouTube for two and a half years. I saw this censorship thing coming in. And frankly, I don't really even talk about, I mean, I don't think I talk about anything controversial. And, but I saw this coming and I didn't want to ever be in a situation where I was relying on YouTube. And I just said, I'm not using it anymore. I had a growing live stream going at about four or five, I think I had 5,000 subscribers at one point. And I just stopped using it and I started using alternative platforms exclusively. I use Rumble, I use Odyssey, and I use BitChute. And I get, at, at, actually, when I stopped using YouTube because of the change in the algorithm, Ken, I started getting basically the same amount of views on my alternative platforms I was getting on YouTube. So I really didn't lose anything other than one cohesive place where everyone was. Um, I don't write as much anymore on smallgirl.com. I just post the videos, but I do produce a video at least once a week, sometimes three or four times a week. I haven't figured out a proper live streaming yet. And I don't use like, uh, like uh, looking at my Twitter, it says like when you, uh, I don't really use Twitter that much. I use more uh, Gab, I use Minds. Um, I try to stay away from those platforms on principle, just because when you open up the screen, they, and I've never used Facebook, they inundate you with what they want you to see. And I'm not interested in getting propaganda fed in my face. And then I see people get booted off for, for saying things that they're not really offensive to me. Um, you know, there's certain things that are offensive to everybody. And I can understand, you know, maybe they want to censor that kind of stuff. But they censor stuff that you wouldn't even think was offensive. And uh, I, I don't like that, that mindset. So anyway, if you want to find small gold, smallgold.com, smallgold on. Gab, smuggled on mine, smuggled on Rumble, smuggled on Odyssey, and smuggled on Bitchu. All right, Lewis. Uh, Lewis, thanks so much for coming on the show with me today. I look forward to having you on in short order. And yeah, chatting, uh, chatting the markets. It's always good to flush through what's going on. And, uh, you know, this was a good time conversation. It was a real, very real talk on gold. Um, not that we've changed, but I think we're open to, hey, it is what it is. Uh, we got to play the cards were dealt and you know there's an yeah. opportunity cost as well uh to being wrong for you know years right you know i've been playing i've been a bullish on silver and gold for many years and you know uh, that part of my portfolio you know i sure it's been insurance but it hasn't performed uh the way i would have hoped and you know we have to recognize that yeah that we were we were wrong i mean i and you have to know why if you don't ask the question why and you just keep insisting, no, I'm going to be right one day. Okay. <laughs> Not worth it. That's true. All right. All right, man. Thanks so much. Thanks, Ken.